Sure, okay. Yeah, is everyone able to see the screen? Yes, sir. Yeah, OK. So we will have this uh, session on uh, ASCII encoding and decoding. Uh, OK. Different. Okay, okay, uh, let me check. Uh, okay, then I'll, I'll think, yeah, I'll, I'll go back to the normal mode where. Uh, correct, uh, let me go back to the normal. Is, is this one visible? Uh, it may not be a presented one, but, but you can see the full slide, correct? Yeah, okay, okay, so we will use this. Uh, yeah, so we will talk about ASCII encoding and decoding, uh, which is uh, like, uh, I mean, it, it's easy, very easy to understand uh, how it is done. You, you you might already heard about, about it in many places, and in many contexts, you would have seen this. Uh, but I wanted to make this, uh, I mean, keep it here because it, it is very key to a lot of other concepts which we'll learn. For example, where, where you're going to communicate, right? So uh, let us uh, see like how, how how we used to communicate, like, like in olden days, even before the language was uh, part of a human uh, uh, a scope of the human uh, understanding or perception, right? People still used to communicate, even animals uh, communicate, right? So, so they use some form of uh, communication using what is available like, like humans used to use uh, hand uh, gestures or, or or even fire uh, they used to show a distant like when ships used to uh, make their voyages right they used to use uh, fire as a means of communication your lighthouse used to have a lamp and then the lamp will give enough light so that people can find their uh, way and things like that so so essentially you are using an existing medium to, to basically convey some information and uh, and you you can naturally I mean you can only use what is already available correct so uh, the, the people should be familiar with that and and, and then you you are using that to communicate uh, some some information right uh, for example in olden days like you used to have telegraph right so so the signals used to be in uh, we, we will see a video on that small video but essentially the the message which you want to communicate has been encoded into some electrical signals which are sent over current wires and then at they are receiving it these are reconstructed so basically converting your uh, intended message into into whatever can be sent on the medium is roughly your encoding process and the reverse of it is your uh, decoding process. Even before telegraph, I mean, people used to have a large, uh, what do you call, fan type of uh, equipment. So there used to be high, tall towers, and then there used to be hand signals. So whatever you wanted to send, right, let's say from some, I mean, this used to be very, if you look at a European, like English, you know, old novels or anything, right, like, like that. and. Europe, they used to, like from one end of the continent to the other end, they used to be able to send messages within a few hours. That was possible because they used to have these tall towers and hand signals. So these uh, one hand signal, based on that whatever uh, the hand signal is rotated in some form, the next tower used to see that one person used to be here um, doing the gesture and other person used to see that and he used to convey the same gesture to the other tower behind him. 
so that way the towers may be like half a kilometer or even less than half a kilometer, 100 meters distance where they could see each other but the other next tower cannot see this tower right so that way from tower to tower they used to convey this visual mechanism and then all the way you could cross cities uh, rural areas continents they used to send these messages that was like an early form of telegraph telegraph which later got converted into electrical method which was much much faster and easier so we talked about digital coding in the law in a, in, a, in the previous session also correct so so we we wanted a decimal we we had decimal numbers and uh, we had digital electronics right we had ones and zeros all our gates can only carry ones or zeros and we want to convey a much complex information like a decimal number like uh, 10428 or something in digital form so that using the electronics underlying electronics we can store the numbers or we can send the numbers in in, in some way right so we used to convert numbers into decimal equivalents and then the decimal uh, using the digital number let's say i i, I have something like uh, uh, one second Yeah, for some reason I'm not able to uh, type, but let, let me try again. Yeah, for some reason I'm not able to type, but the, but that's fine. Uh, so basically, uh, if you had even seen the last week's example, right, uh, the assignments which I had given, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just take one example. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're, if you're able to so do I need to present again right let me present again yeah so 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 we had uh, decimal numbers which we can convert to digital form or when when we had uh, digital numbers digit digits or bits we could uh, convert it and say what what is a decimal form the decimal form is more uh, amenable to human beings uh, they, they, well, like we can talk to people in various disciplines using decimal whereas we, it, it is very difficult to do it in binary binary is something which the computer understands so whatever is already available as a medium we are trying to encode it into uh, into that form so so converting it into that form is essentially your uh, encoding the reverse of it is uh, decoding correct so so with that uh, uh, context let us see what happens with, uh, with, with with the topic that we are going to talk about okay so uh, so we have uh, okay so so we will talk about a, a, a very standard very popular very widely used uh, standard industry standard which is called ASCII or ASCII ASCII for short so it ASCII is nothing but it states it's it stands for American standard for character information and interchange uh ho hope everybody is able to see this right uh, I, I I was switching the windows on and off hello Yes, Manoharji, we yeah, can okay. able to see it. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So ASCII stands for American Standard for Character Information Interchange. So it, it, it is an American standard, it, uh, meaning it, it, it was originated in the US. And uh, it is basically for character exchange. So we talked about uh, the decimal numbers last week, right? But uh, we, uh, in English uh, parlance, we have numbers we have characters we have the entire language 26 characters so this code was invented to basically convert or, or be to be basically be able to communicate all these information characters in a digital form so it's basically a character encoding standard for electronics communication and it is also an iso standard iec 646 is for uh, ascii and it derived its origin like as we already talked about uh, from the morse code used in telegraphy telegraphy i would say 
was the first major successful method of communicating uh, information messages across large geographical areas countries and continents for a long long time right uh, and uh, we will we will see a small video of it so that we get a context of what it is and uh, then we will uh, go for uh, we, we will continue with the class uh, so so can uh, can somebody help to communicate this video to to to, to put this video yeah Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, put it in the text box. Looking for a free project manager? Yeah, yeah. Unlimited users and visible. unlimited projects? Give Bitrix24 a try. Bitrix24 makes it easy to create a project time. Did you get that? If you lived in the 1850s or are a modern amateur radio operator, you might have. That's Morse code, and in an age of constant information communication, it wasn't too long ago that this communication method was vital to making the world go round. Back in the early 1800s, engineers and scientists were just starting to pioneer electrical communication methods. engineers and scientists were just starting to pioneer electrical communication methods. In 1836, Samuel Morse, Joseph Henry, and Alfred Vail invented the electrical telegraph system. It was the first system that allowed communication over great distances. However, there was a problem. It could only communicate pulses of electricity to another machine. This meant that you wouldn't be able to communicate using voice or text, so a new way of getting messages across the world was needed. A code was developed by none other than Samuel Morse to translate electrical pulses back into the original message. Originally, Morse's code only incorporated numbers, but Vail helped expand it to include letters and other characters. Morse code was born. The code assigned a sequence of short and long pulses to numbers and letters. Later, these pulses would be thought of as dots and dashes. The rules of Morse code are as follows. Each dot serves as the basis of time for the code. One dash is equivalent to the length of three dots. After each character, there's a silence that is equivalent to the length of one dot. This relative timing allows for Morse code to be easily sped up and slowed down, all while keeping the same pace. As far as how Samuel Morse and Alfred Vail decided on how to assign the specific sequences of dots and dashes to each letter, they actually studied the frequency of which each letter was used in the English language. They then assigned the easier dot and dash sequences to the most used letters during that time period. For example, E, the most common letter, is represented by a single dot. 
Originally, telegraph machines would mark sheets of tape with the message, but eventually telegraph operators learned to translate these dots and dashes audibly, making the tape unnecessary. This also meant that Morse code started being taught as an audible language, rather than a written one of symbols. In 1905, the International Morse Code Distress Signal was used, otherwise known as SOS. This became the standard maritime distress signal around the world within the coming years. These series of letters were actually chosen for their simplicity, not for the letters SOS. It wasn't until later that people began associating phrasing with those letters, like save our ship or save our souls. So, Morse code was invented as a necessity of the first mass communication method utilizing only electrical pulses. It was, and to some degree it still is, a vital means of communication across the world. Yeah, so, um, yeah, th thanks. Uh, so, yeah, so this is uh, amazing, right? Uh, almost 200 years back. People were able to communicate uh, using electrical. I mean, they, they could use electrical signals to communicate uh, messages, and that was that was prevalent for almost to uh, like two full centuries before uh, better technologies came into being to 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 to, to, to essentially enable better forms of uh, communication. I mean, just just imagine what what we can what all we can communicate today, and and how it all originated so this was essentially to set the context how the the, the need for encoding and decoding came to be so we use an existing medium to convey something more uh, to the other end so that is how uh, it is there so let us uh, continue the discussion mm -hmm. on digital coding so basically we are using bits and bytes to convey uh, information and uh, basically converting our information into a stream of ones and zeros which we saw in the previous session right how how, how the ones and zeros can be processed stored and communicated according to some pre-agreed method so so this that, that this is very very important correct uh, the, the other side needs to know what 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 method you're using otherwise it's not possible uh, li like for example even in the morse code telegraphy right the person who sends it as well as the person who receives both of them have to be familiar with that code like one dot means e has to be agreed upon and and sos has to be agreed upon how a represents in morse code has to be agreed upon so there has to be a pre-agreed method on how we are going to send that information and what information we are going to send is what the sender decides and the receiver doesn't know yet but using this commonly agreed method the receiver ultimately knows what the sender intended to convey this is like a beautiful concept correct the the medium does not know what what has to be sent the medium can only say one or zero correct and uh, the in, in the morse code it was one dot and dash as a short beep versus a long beep that that's all can be conveyed and uh but, but you could convey complete paragraphs english everything right similarly uh we, we can do using the digital coding correct so this is the ascii encoding table as presented in the uh, ascii standard itself right so so how do we interpret it is here so uh, you have you i mean today we, we have eight bits because it's uh, like eight bits is like one byte of information which is a very standard but ascii was actually planned and designed and implemented to use seven bits of information so uh, the the bits b6 b5 and b4 uh, are actually the, the upper bits which you can see on the row top row and then b0 b1 b2 b3 are the columns okay so this right hand side this portion here 
are the information that you can send. Uh, like, like you can see the characters, English characters A to Z. And then you have uh, the same A to Z in lowercase and uppercase. And then you have all this comma, semicolon, upper, uh, greater than, less than, all that. So all, all, all the characters typically you can see on a, on a standard English keyboard is encoded in the ASCII form. Okay, so so if you take a very simple example, the letter A, character A. Okay, so if you go back to the table, we have A here, and then we have the which which column it it is there. It is in the column one zero zero, right? So if you take uh, the this eighth bit, we can ignore bit seven, we can ignore. So it is one zero zero, and then row wise also it is zero 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 one is in a so so this is a right so one zero 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 one so that is the encoding for character a english character a as represented in digital format in ascii standard is zero one zero 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 one okay similarly character e is it is in the same column, right? But it is in the row which stands for five, right? So zero one zero one zero one, right? So one zero zero and then zero one zero one. Right. So character E is encoded in digital form as zero one zero zero and zero one zero one. Okay. Similarly, we can have very different kind of examples. For example, the semicolon is zero zero one 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 zero one one semicolon if you see right zero one one this is uh, column number three and then row number eleven so zero one one and then one zero one one right so so that is how uh, semicolon is represented zero zero one one if you take from bit six zero one 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 zero one okay so let us find out what is there in what for this ascii code so we got Somebody gave us an ASCII code. It came, let's say it came in our communication, and then we have to decode this. Okay. So what? How we do? So so we we saw how the encoding happened. Now we will decode it. Okay. So one one zero, right? So one one zero is row column six. Okay. In column six, we have one zero zero zero, which is eight, right? Row number eight. Okay. So. 1108. So this is nothing but character H. Okay. Got it right. Uh, sorry. No, sir. It's clear. This was lowercase h. Yeah. Okay. So this was uh, basically lowercase h represented in ASCII. Okay. So this is the very basic fundamental of uh, ASCII. There is nothing great about it. It is basically a table where uh, a, a seven-bit stream is used to represent all the characters which is which are needed in English character communication. An extension of this is today you see things like Unicode and all that. So Unicode is use, is, is, uses all the full eight bits and it can be used for uh, various languages. So it's, it's not restricted to English. It can be used for um, uh, like, uh, 20, like maybe even 100 different languages are, I think, supported in Unicode. But, but ASCII is kind of the fundamental because when it comes to English, even Unicode uses the ASCII table only for communicating. And in addition to the characters uh, A to Z and uh, all these uh, uh, punctuations, uh, semicolon, colon, comma, plus, minus, same, uh, mathematical symbols, dollar, and all that stuff. There are some other control characters also. Like, for example, your carriage return, which is nothing but when, when you send the enter, uh, this character will be sent, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, which is uh, CR. I think there is something for LF also. And then there is a null, and then there is a del character. Delete is there, uh, which you can see in your keyboard also. So that is the simple way how uh, 
these uh, digital media can be used for sending human intelligible information so so that is uh, ascii is essentially for conveying a language in digital form uh, you can take it that way okay now something very closely uh, related to it but not to be confused with that is hexadecimal encoding right so we saw 8 bits correct and then uh, up up to 10 we know it is all decimal number 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 but uh, decimal works uh, sorry digital works in powers of 2 right we saw so we have uh, one bit which we can represent 0 and 1 2 bits means we can go up to 4 0 1 2 3 uh, like that we can go up to 8 3 bits but 4 bit means it goes to 16 which means it crosses 10 and then it goes to something more than that so uh, when we go go into decimal it will be like 16 but uh, they came up with something more uh, uh, useful it's like the numbers from 10 to 16 uh, digital numbers from 10 to 16 uh, they could represent using alphabets a b c d e f okay so so we can have zero all the way up to nine and then when it comes to e 10 uh, decimal 10 it is typically represented in this coding form called a a b c d all the way up to f so hexadecimal is basically another way of representing digital numbers only but then you have to say right one zero one 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 zero one like for, for like four bits it becomes uh, okay but but when you go for multiple like eight bit 32 bits and all it became very difficult to to communicate in a like a language when when you talk to somebody and then you're you're giving some uh, one quantity right so it's, it's very difficult to read out uh, something like 32 bits of ones and zeros it's it's very difficult to read out as well as to follow closely on the receiver side so they came up with this hexadecimal coding where we could use uh, characters for 10 to 15 okay so so if you go back to one of these examples right uh, uh, a will be very confusing so let us go back to this example right so so we have four bits here and then another four bits here so so this is very clear right so so we can say this is five and then this is what uh, four four five four five means e correct but but let's say if you go back to something like this one zero one one Right, we have the semicolon which is 1011. So 1011 is 13, right, in, in decimal. And if you go in the hexadecimal, it is D, correct? So, so 0D is, uh, you, you can actually take that, uh, or, or 6D, sorry. 6D is your hexadecimal or, or semicolon, correct? So the same semicolon can be represented in, in bits. See, at, at, at the uh, we, we have to remember that at, at the transistor level, in your circuit, in your PCB, everything is bits only ones and zeros. The hexadecimal is just a way for us to understand and communicate much more easily than the computer so that it, it is much more easier. So 1011, we can simply say 6D. This is uh, easier to remember and uh, handle then something like this correct so that that is the thing uh, hexadecimal can be used for any uh, set of digital information which is a multiple of four bits okay so four bits four bits each four bit is assigned something which is between 0 to f like that we can represent even very big numbers 32 bits 64 bits in hexadecimal form later on you will find it very useful i'm just bringing it here so that your eight bit in, in fact, this is just four bits, and eight bit is uh, represented in, in two hexadecimal letters. Okay, so in the later on, when we go with the uh, digital design for more complex concepts, we will very often be using hexadecimal and ASCII interchangeably. That's why I brought this uh, concept here. So I, I will stop this ASCII presentation here. Let us uh, pause for the questions, and then we will go to the next topic uh, based on how much uh, time we have. Okay. Yeah, so questions, thoughts?
so in hexadecimal coding the 16 is uh, again given as 10 is it uh, is it same as 10 uh, okay so let me present it's back So what, what, what was your question? Uh, Here, uh, 16 is uh, given as 10, no, sir. Correct. Yeah, it, it is, uh, this is hexadecimal. Yeah, see, for example, this is 1, and then this is 0. So, so we, we, we are rolling over. See, just like in a decimal, after 9, we are we are run out of digits here, correct? So we, we came up with the concept of 10. Uh, human beings came with the concept of 10. So after F, we are stopping there. So we are hexa means 16, right? So we are stopping at 16th digit. For 16th digit, we need a new representation, which is nothing but 0. And uh, your upper uh, digit will be 1. So it is hexadecimal 10. Okay, sir. So like that, it will go 1011, like that. Okay. Very good question, actually. Yes. Manohar ji. Yes. In the presentation uh, for uh, uh, hexadecimal form for the semicolons. You have written the 6D. Yeah. Uh, by dividing that binary number into four, uh, like four bits as one, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Like four bits as for one uh, hexadecimal form. Correct. Can you please show that uh, slide? Uh, I just have confused. Yeah. yeah. I'm here. Uh... So you wanted a semicolon, right? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, Manohar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. For, first of all, it, it's 3D. It's not uh, 60. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, ah, yeah, yes, yes, sir. But yeah. uh, it is not D. I think so because uh, it is 11. 3B. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, 3D. Yes. Th that's what my confusion. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. Sorry. Um, that's it, Manohar. Sure. Th thanks for pointing out. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Um, okay, can we move on to the UART one? Or, or? We can go probably, we can go up to 415. We'll stop at 415 today. Is it okay with everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, okay. So let me present the next one. Okay, so uh, in, in the digital electronics course, we will be studying various uh, protocols. Okay, so uh, I started with UART because it's one of the simplest one. And uh, I would like to call it the God of small interfaces because it's like a very fundamental and very basic one. And, it, it, and, and still it is like uh, fairly standard and fairly complex, meaning if you really implement it on a system, right, and, and, and if you're able to get two people to communicate or two printed circuit boards to communicate uh, using UART, right, I mean, that's some something reasonably complex. You, you definitely achieved something because there are so many things involved. This entire ASCII code is involved. Any kind of coding you can use, of course. But uh, yeah, so, so essentially, like whatever we said in coding, right, we are moving to the next step. We're actually trying to communicate from a sender to a receiver some useful information. And how do we do it? Okay. So like, like in telegraphy, you saw that we could use Morse code. Uh, but in digital, we are, we are essentially talking about two completely electronic systems. There is no human in, involved. So the two systems have to understand each other and, and be able to communicate. Okay. So we will talk about the we will we'll talk about communication topologies first and basics of UART 
uh, we'll see the UART application. What what are the frame structure used? And we'll talk about something called RS two thirty two, which which is very closely related and and very useful later on also. Okay. So uh, we will talk about uh, topologies. What 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 is a topology? Okay. So we have something called a bus topology, right? So which means th there is a common uh, you as you assume that there is a common like a bus means everybody can go in and travel. There is an equal importance to all the passengers in the bus. Let's say, right? So, which, so which means uh, anybody can talk, anybody can uh, hear. Okay. So, so if you look at this, there, there is a common uh, line here, and then uh, anybody can talk. Like, like there, there, there is of course some initial setup needed to establish who is going to talk and who is going to receive. Because let's say if more than one person wants to talk at the same time, uh, there, there has to be some agreement how how it is agreed. So, so let's assume that. That setup has been done, but effectively, anybody can talk to anybody. Let's let's say that this box out here can talk to this box, and and act, actually anybody can listen. So if, if this person is talking, anybody who's connected on the bus can listen. Correct. So so if you take in a conference, right? If 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 uh, somebody is talking, usually everybody else can listen. But but when when another person wants to talk, we we agree on some protocol. Let's say hey, I I'm stopping. Talk, you start something like some some kind of uh, handshake we do, but but then the other person can talk and then everybody can listen, and uh, typically anybody can talk as uh, at, at least uh, the the infrastructure allows in, in in a Zoom meeting or in a Google Meet, any of us can talk, right? Uh, only only thing we need to have some rules and uh, to follow so that we know who's talking and what 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 uh, is talking and so that there is no cross talk or anything. So this is also possible in a in a in in, in a hardware electric electronic situation, where there can be multiple transmitters and multiple receivers all in a equal footing. Okay, so this is called bus topology, and uh, the the next topology we can call it as star topology, uh, where uh, everybody is not equal here in this case, right? So so there is a master. And then there is there are multiple slaves, which means all communication has to go through the master only. So so one slave cannot talk to the other slave, or or if even if one slave is talking, the other slave cannot listen it straight away. It has to go through the master, and then it has to go through the slave. A, a real time example in the communication itself is your Ethernet router. Usually you have a hub where multi you connect your Ethernet port, and then the communication goes through the hub in your, in your home router or in your college setup. You would have seen Wi-Fi routers uh, where uh, apart from Wi-Fi, you will have all these uh, Ethernet wires coming connecting with each other. And then uh, they, they will be uh, like, like the individual, uh, your laptop or workstation first has to establish communication with the hub. And whatever data is communicated, it goes through that hub and from that hub only it goes even let's say you want to talk with another laptop on to share a desktop or whatever it is it has to go through the master so this is like your master slave topology uh, another uh, analogy could be uh, like a strict like a classroom in in a college right the typically the professor is the one or the lecturer is the one who will do the talking you talk to the uh, professor or lecturer if you have a question you raise your hand you talk to the Lecturer, ask a question or whatever. You are normally not allowed to talk to the next student in a, in a live classroom session. Before the classroom or after the classroom, it may vary. But in in a, in a class, this is the star topology. Is what what you typically follow, right? There is also a peer to peer topology or a one to one topology or an ad hoc topology. Let's say two people just decide to talk. Let's say I want to talk to Rakshit or I want to talk to. Uh, Alex, yeah, let's say so. So I, I I can give a chat, and I can ask a question, or uh, Alex or Rakshit can ask me a question. So basically, two uh, two entities on a peer to peer level uh, are quickly agree on a communication method and start talking. Right. So that is called ad hoc or one on one communication. Okay. So so we saw three topologies here: bus, star, and ad hoc or peer to peer topology or one on one to one topology the uart is a peer to peer topology meaning there has to be a designated transmitter 
and a designated receiver or or, or there has to be only there, there can only be two entities in a UART system if there are more than two entities they, we have to have separate connections to talk to it let's say there is one entity which talks to two people it has to have a dedicated UART protocol established between each of the entities which means at any point of time there can only be two entities in the system usually there is a transmit line wire a connection and then a receive line and then there is a ground i mean this is like the simplest form of uart communication using one on one topology the transmitter a receiver and a ground connection okay so using this wire if it is operated in a digital form meaning if, if it can go up to 5 volts or it can stay at 0 volt if these are the only two states then it can be used to transmit all these zeros and ones from the transmit to the receiver correct agree with me so transmit to the receiver i can send ones and zeros okay and that is what exactly happens in a uart also so there is a device a and then there is a device b and then you establish a protocol using the digital transitions of zero and ones okay but then you need to know upfront correct so so for example we are having we are setting up a meet and then like eight to ten people are talking or let's say i have to talk to another person i have to at least know whether the person is available so either i do a ring when, when i just have when, like when i try to call uh, there is a ring tone or if i want to do a whatsapp uh, call i say hello are you available for a small discussion let's say right so similarly in uart we have something called a start bit okay it, it's called a start bit because it's in binary usually it's a single pulse duration and then when you end the communication you also have a stop bit and within the two we can communicate typically in most of the cases it will be eight bits of information we already talked about ascii which uses seven bits or eight bits so this is or, or a unicode which uses eight bits so a uart is immediately and very easily able to <coughs> use ascii as a one of the communication methods one of the encoding methods you you could typically send anything any 0 to 255 you can send anything it need not be ascii also you can send plain binary information the end parties will know what is being communicated let's assume that so this portion the uart is only concerned about starting a communication sending eight bits and stopping at the at the simplest in its simplest form in in in, in a more uh, practical form there, there 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 can be two stop bits and and there is a reason to it will come to it later and then there is also something called a parity because communication media can be noisy so any of these bits could have been corrupted let's say bit 0 to bit uh, 7 255 combinations let's say one bit b5 got corrupted uh, the end person may interpret it as something else e even in the ascii table if, if you go back right uh, uh, each each of those 128 characters can will, will mean some a, a different character so if this one bit from instead of being a one, it became zero, you will communicate it entirely different character. So, so there is a mechanism called parity. You might have already heard of it. Parity is in a very simple mathematical sense. It's a, it's an XOR of these bits, and uh, effectively tells how many uh, bits are one or how many bits are zero. It effectively tells whether there are odd number of ones or odd number of zeros in a in an 8-bit stream. So with that, let's say there were two bits, B3 and B4 were 1, which means you had odd parity. But let's say B4 became 0. So sorry, we, we had even parity. Two bits were high, right? And if B4 became 0, only one bit will be high, which means it became an even parity. So the parity bit would have told it's an even parity. But at the receiver end, we are not having even number of bits. There are only one bit, one bit being high. So the receiver will know something is wrong in this particular 8-bit combination. So using that one parity bit, it will reject that 8 bits. So, so what will happen subsequently is beyond the scope of UART. 
but reject means it would have decided to send some error code in its uh, receive direction later on the two entities will come to know that uh, that character has to be recent because the you all you have both the transmit and the receive right so in the receive side it might send some code and then the, that particular by a bit or byte might have been sent again so you what incorporates a mechanism of error checking in its more practical form and that is your parity bit okay and uh, some devices in the early days were too slow so one bit of stop and then again starting like in a very tight communication right where back to back bits and bytes have to be sent after this first stop bit let's say uh, you if you, if you sent a start bit some device receivers could not receive it they they were too slow to respond so they came up with two stop bits so that there is enough delay pause given for the next byte to be sent right so so uh, like like for example when when you are speaking right if if you talk slow enough the the receivers the listeners can and can be in a much better position to understand the information being sent so so this is like a very similar concept here okay okay so we we, we saw this basic frame structure here okay but when do we start calling a bit a bit correct so 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 let's say you 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 have this information here so b0 is the so so i have so for uh, our understanding within a ppt slide i have given some width for b0 right starting from this point up to this point is b0 but did we communicate how wide this bit is going to be no correct so the receiver has to know when the boundaries between two bits correct so for example if if my information was something like this like 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 for example some some something like 101011 like that so there there is there are two ones here so unless the receiver knew that there 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 are two ones right i mean he he may interpret it this as one single one also right so we need to have some division some kind of demarcation correct and we saw that there are only three lines here correct so so uh, the transmitter is sending ones and zeros and the receiver somehow has to know after the start bit let's say let is let's say the start bit was somehow recognizable but between the bits right where one bit stops and where another bit started is not known from this picture so that's why they came up with some form of parameters right so so the one of the, the basic parameters is the speed or the baud rate which means that how wide is one pulse baud rate is how many bits per second correct so so let's say 100 bits per second means you know that one bit duration is 100th of a second so if if i if if my receiver as a receiver i see a one for 100th of a second i know that the sender has sent me a bit called one after the 100th of a second instant if it still continues to be one which means the second bit has already started so the receiver uh, will know that the second bit has come and then number of data bits also should be known correct so 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 uh, we we said b7 but it it, it can also be eight full bits or or it can be seven bits and one parity it can be eight bits and parity so this this was like one example correct in 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 a more practical form but the number of bits can also be agreed upon parity can be agreed upon one is whether we should use parity or not also should be known and if you are using parity whether it's odd or even also should be known meaning if number of bits are one in the original message i will send a one which means it's odd parity or if it's a even parity means it it will be the other way so how are you representing the number of parity bits is is one parameter and number of stop bits so all these are variables the key point here is before the communication starts both the transmitter and the receiver should agree upon 
all these basic parameters. Correct. Otherwise, there is no way of knowing. U what does not allow on its own. It does not allow communicating these parameters over the wire. It it has to be agreed upon. So which which means that you will have a sixteen hundred baud rate transmitter which can only talk to a sixteen hundred baud rate receiver. The number of data bits parity enabled or disabled all of them have to match. So that is a very key concept which we have to understand. It is a pre the parameters have to be pre agreed. It it is quite possible that uh, two systems they they can start with the default set of parameters like it can be typically how it happens is you start with the lowest baud rate like hundred or thousand two hundred I think thousand two hundred used to be a standard for long time so you start with thousand two hundred eight bits no parity one stop bit typically all the receivers are expected to support this configuration of the default configuration. So with this configuration, the transmitter sends some initial bytes, which are the actual configuration parameters to be used. Like thousand two hundred bits per second could be very slow. Today I can go up to one twenty eight kilobits per second, or even one megabit per second. Uh, I, 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 I think U watts are available at least for the hundreds of kilobits per second. I would think, right? So. Uh, 1200 is only for basic setup and then I can always move to a better set of configuration. So the configuration parameters itself in using some protocol which is not defined by you what you you can use any method but those parameters are sent and then at some point you are ready to communicate in the speed you want in the number of bits parity stop bits everything. So using that we have this concept. Correct. So, so we have a so I'll, uh, usually the line is idle, and then there is a start bit of one bit of zero, and then D one to D eight, which essentially is B zero to B seven, is being communicated, and then stop one and stop two. Okay. So that is the information that is going to be transmitted, and on the line, if you put a CRO, you can actually see the waveform. Like this. This is a digital representation of this electrical rep waveform representation of this information. This is how it will actually look. And uh, you can think what is this clock here? So, clock is nothing but your baud rate. Only thing that that clock is not being communicated. It is pre agreed that it will be like 1600 baud rate or 3200 or 128 kilobits per second, whatever. But individually, when you send out the bits, you will naturally use a clock. We will later on see how it is done using a flip flop or a sequential circuit. You will use a clock. The, the output circuit of the UART will have a transmitter, which will be typically a shift register, where the shift register will be given a clock of this width rate, pulse width rate. So if it's a 1600 baud means you will be feeding a clock of 16 hertz, 1600 hertz, correct? And uh, the receiver will sample the incoming data using a shift register, a shift in register, and that will also be fed with the same clock frequency of 1600. So once these basic conditions are satisfied, you can continuously start communicating uh, you can continue communicating using this method any number of bytes or characters or whatever information you want to send. So this is in principle the basic fundamentals of UART. Uh, there are many textbooks where you can go into details. We can have a detailed session also. But this is what uh, kind of the very basics of UART communication. It is a serial communication protocol. It is a one-on-one, -on -one, it uses a one-on-one -on -one topology, peer-to-peer. -peer. There will be one entity talking to, there can be only two devices using transmit and receive at a very basic level. And uh, the frame structure, we also saw the frame structure of the UART. Any quick questions at this point in time? Oh, I don't know.
Okay, so not audible. Okay, can you talk closer to the mic or something? Uh, hello? Yeah. Am I on now? Yeah, better now, yeah. Uh, I'm asking that uh, whether the medium is a normal wire, uh, like to pass signals, or it is an optical fiber, like any other thing. It is uh, typically a wire. Okay, so in 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 its most simple form, it is like usually this is a UART is uh, a protocol is used to communicate between two circuit boards, printed circuit boards. Uh, or, or even within a circuit board between two separate entities, two devices which can communicate with each other. Uh, it You can use uh, fiber optics or, or, or any other uh, medium also because it is all bits it, it and you don't need additional clock signal. All you need is a transmit and a receive. It, it, it can be any method. But typical exam, typical implementations are uh, electronic uh, electrical de devices where you have printed circuit board traces or even cable. Like for example, if you take uh, uh, an intelligent terminal connected to a server machine, it will be a cable which will run like, like they, they call it RS-232 cable. So there will be a connector. I, I was going to cover that uh, shortly. So there will be a connector on either side. And uh, in fact, it will have more than uh, transmit and receive, there will be few other signals to establish some minimum handshake. But yes, uh, to answer your question, it can be a wire, it can be a fiber optics, but most of the implementation you would see are uh, electrical, I could say. Okay, Manoharji. Sure, thank you. Uh, any other question? Okay, we will uh, go to the next session. It is a very, I mean, the next part of the uh, slide. Uh, so, so basically, along with, uh, so we saw this example, right, uh, where uh, 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 two two devices, uh, uh, a terminal device. So, so, we saw in even in the Linux class in older days, right. So, there were typing devices called teleprinter devices, which could be used to communicate to the central computing server which will be like some pdp 11 sitting in some other part of the city and then you'll have all these communication cables typically your phone cables can be used and uh, uh, you, you you could communicate over longer distances and th there will be actually one modem which can convert this uh, on, uh this ones and zeros into a analog form which is more suitable for sending over uh, telephone wire themselves so your uh, teleprinter will have a transmitter and then there will be a modem which will have the receiver. So then the UART communication will be between this modem and the teleprinter device. And then later after that, it will be all your telephone cable, let's say. So uh, RS-232 was a standard used between the terminal device and the communication device. So your uh, teleprinter was your terminal device called DTE data terminal equipment and uh, your modem is your DC, uh, data communication equipment. So RS-232 was a standard. It is an IEEE standard. And two devices which are on different equipment, your modem was a separate box, your teleprinter is a separate box. And uh, you can use RS-232. So RS-232 is your physical layer of uh, implementation uh, using electrical signals. UART will be the protocol that will be used on top of it. Okay, so uh, for a logic high, you will use anything between plus three volts to minus fifteen volts. So you see that it's no longer uh, your TTL digital of zero to five volts. It is actually three to fifteen. Later on, it was uh, like zero to twelve and zero to minus twelve. Also, uh, some later devices are were more standardized to the twelve volt. Uh, standard because 12 volt was uh, very much available in automobile and so many places like battery a lot of them are got standardized to 12 volts so you had started becoming implementing uh, 12 volts as a standard so uh, so there are converters 1488 and 1489 devices 
which will convert your UART communication to an RS-232. And uh, these uh, RS-232 standards, these were the voltages. So separate devices on the PCB will convert TTL UART signals to RS-232 standards. Okay. And uh, this is how your bit stream would look like. Uh, start bit and then uh, your uh, so start bit would, would, would actually be 3 to minus 3 or minus 15 whatever it is depending on your implementation and then you would have this uh, bit stream and then you will have this stop bit so electrically the what happens on the device or, or what happens on the cable right rs232 cable will be very much similar to this dark thick line here so you will have an idle then start bit all the bit stream and stop bit we, we, we don't have the parity, but parity will also be there. So this is how it used to be. And these were the co connectors that were go that were used. A very older systems used 15, 25 pin connectors. And then later on, we used to have nine pin connectors. Most of the PCBs, like 10, 15 years back, if you open up a laptop, sorry, a desktop, you will see communication ports, uh, COM ports, they used to call it COM A, COM B. Typically, printers used to have uh, serial communication for a long, long time. And they used RS-232 and they used uh, uh, UART protocol. Okay. And uh, the, uh, so apart from the two data bits, right, which we discussed, transmit data from DTE to DC and receive data from DC to DTE and ground. There were these other signals are also being used in RS-232, okay? So UART restricts itself to these three, but RS-232 has this all other things. So we will cover this in a different class. So basically there is something called data set ready, data terminal ready, uh, data carrier detect. So, so how to know whether the other end is active or not. Your printer may be switched off, so you can't send the data. So the printer has to send back some information saying I'm alive, ready to print. So all those uh, communication used to happen with this additional auxiliary signals. But the actual data was always used, was sent using this TXT, RXT and ground, okay? And uh, the, <clears throat> this is how the connectors looked like. Uh, from the PCB, You like, like in, a, in a desktop, you can see this very often two COM ports would be there and you could connect to printers or plotters or uh, even a modem, for example. Today you connect uh, Ethernet, but even let's say six to eight years back, we used to have uh, modems which will connect to your hand phone, your uh, regular BSNL phone and your uh, internet will come through the BSNL uh, communication. 128 kilobits per second you can transmit. So you can connect to the internet using this uh, PCB here. So you, so the desktops we did not have, you can go to Ritchie Street in Chennai and buy this for like 200, 300 rupees. Uh, go to the BSNL office, get an internet connection, and then you are ready to connect to the internet. I think even 15 years back, uh, 20 years back, it used to be like that. Till recently, till till we had 2G, 3G, 4G, we, we had uh, this kind of devices actually. The, the reason I we are talking about this is this is still being prevalent in many areas. Even in today's PCB, if you want to do some debugging, if you have an embedded system, your microcontroller, the easiest way to, to ensure uh, your, your device is working is you can have a debug port which supports UART, connect a, a serial cable, have a USB to serial converter, connect it to the device, do a lot, many of your electronic lab and uh, computer labs will have this method where uh, debugging complex circuits with microcontrollers, you will have a UART device and it will, it will very often come in the moment you join your industry or even your project, right? It, it will very much have a UART. And it, it's a very simple protocol to implement actually. So that's uh, mostly what I had on you what hope you're able to follow. Uh, I took more than two minutes, but uh, we can definitely have some questions. Uh, if I'm not able to follow something, please let me know. Okay. 
any questions uh, please In RS Super T2, logic high is given as plus 3 to minus 15 volts and logic low as minus 3 to plus 15. Is it not the reverse? Not yeah, yeah, so, sorry about that. Yeah, so the question was uh, uh, in, in RS232, logical high is represented as plus 3 to minus 15, and the logic low is minus uh, 3 to plus 15, right? So, uh, the question was shouldn't have been reversed. No, this is the correct one. Because if you look at this, uh, the idle state is is uh, minus three to minus fifteen, right? So so it is easier to maintain a maintain this idle state in a negative state for a much longer time electrically. That's why they have chosen uh, a logic zero to be represented in uh, in 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 the minus range, and and the moment you Sorry, so the logic high to be represented in uh, in in the minus range. Idle is logic high. Start bit is actually logic low, but then logic low is actually the plus voltage. So this is the actual. If you go to the RS232 standard, this is how it is done actually. So so there is there is a analog inverter to to actually actually convert your logic high to uh, electrical negative signal. 14 so if you google for a device called 1488 1488 uh, you can see the specifications of the device and uh, in fact that that was going to be my assignment as well so uh, you, you you could uh, look at it and that that is how the standard is actually okay sir thank you sure good, good question actually Sure. Yeah, you, you could always uh, email the questions in the classroom. Uh, you, you, you can put it in the classroom. I will uh, send out the assignments. Uh, I, I'm, I'm still overdue on the previous assignment uh, uh, grading. Uh, I will finish the grading for the digital electronics part one, uh, latest by tomorrow morning. Uh, but whoever has not submitted, I know a few people are still in the exams. So uh, I'm, I'm allowing this time. But uh, please do complete it. Thanks for people who have already done. And uh, I will send out the assignments for uh, this session, by latest by Tuesday afternoon. And uh, before that, please, whatever your questions you have, uh, please go through this. Uh, these are like very basic sessions. Uh, you may not uh, have the opportunity to uh, hear these sessions later on. So, so even if you're not, uh, people who are not been able to attend, uh, Please ask them to go through the videos and I always refer back to these classes. Uh, these are very important. And uh, th th thanks for being around and uh, uh, have a nice time, actually. Yeah. Thank you for, yeah. Thank you, Manohar. Sure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll meet next week. Sure. Yeah.